The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to ReproAction's Act and Learn webinar for the month of March 2021. We're very excited for today's topic, which is reproductive justice and astrology. So first, we'll introduce your host for today's program. Um, the first voice you're hearing is Erin Matson. I use she, her pronouns. I am executive director and co-founder of Repro Action. I am based in Arlington, Virginia, and I am Erin to the max on Twitter. Um, and the second voice you're hearing is uh, Tanisha, my, me, Tanisha Henson. I use they, them pronouns. I am the I'm a campaign coordinator for Repro Action. I'm based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and you can find me at DJ Jump Them on Twitter. Thank you. So a uh, brief overview of our agenda. So we'll introduce uh, Repro Action. Um, then we'll uh, talk about the connection between reproductive justice and astrology. Um, then we'll do a panel discussion. We're super excited to be joined by Jay Thibodeau and Shekinah Davis, who also goes by Nina. And um, then we'll do next steps and Q&A. So a couple housekeeping matters. Um, if you want to live tweet this, you're totally encouraged and welcome to do so. Please use the hashtag ReproAction. And second is, if you have questions, we'll get to as many as possible at the end, but you don't have to wait to the end to ask your questions. So you can put them in the questions box at any time. Um, including while our presenters are speaking and our panelists are speaking. Um, so about repro action, we lead bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We're proud of our left flank analysis and we're known for our willingness to hold folks on all sides of the issues we work on accountable, whether they're traditionally considered allies or opposition. And we have a deep commitment to nonviolent direct action as one of the tools in our toolbox. And with that, I'm happy to pass it over to Tanasia, who pulled this entire webinar together. Awesome. Thank you, Erin. Um, so what's the connection between astrology and reproductive justice? Um, that's kind of the magic. The connection can be anything you want or nothing at all. Astrology is meant to be a tool that we choose to use or choose to set aside. Uh, in my own life, I use astrology to inform my experience of the world or as reasoning for why a certain dynamic event or tension is occurring. Um, and the scope of astrology is, the scope that astrology covers is really limitless. Um, and so much can be implied depending on what connections you are seeing or experiencing. You could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so what is astrology really? Um, so astrology is the study of the correlation between astronomical positions of planets and events on Earth. Um, so astronomical positions is the relationship a planet has with a specific constellation that makes the zodiac sign. So this is where we can begin to investigate how astrology can affect reproductive justice movements. Um, and if we look at different positions of planets and constellations of when a specific person was born or an important moment in history, we can further understand dynamics, patterns, and impacts of the movement and also further understand the history of movement, as well as inform tactics and strategies for the present. So a bit of astrology crash course through a reproductive justice lens. Um, looking at astrology through reproductive, with a reproductive justice lens means we should be paying attention to collective. Um, and so planets to pay attention to, would be Venus, which is the planet of love, sexuality, desire, and beauty. Mars, which is the planet of direct action, anger, intensity, and passion. Saturn, which is the planet of restriction, boundaries, and life lessons. And Pluto, which is the planet of transformation, subconscious, death, and rebirth. Um, and signs to pay attention to for the collective. Um, so Scorpio, 
which is a water sign that rules over our reproductive systems and sexual organs, which is also ruled by Pluto, which you remember as the planet of transformation, subconscious death and rebirth. So this can be a really powerful energy that can inform ways in which we desire transformation, especially when thinking about reproductive justice and the importance of having bodily autonomy. Um, another sign to pay attention to is Capricorn, um, which is an earth sign and that rules over our bones and joints. So when we're thinking about collective, we can think about systems, we can think about um, sort of what is the bare bones structure of the society we're living in, what built it. Um, and it's ruled by Saturn and Saturn is the planet of restriction, boundaries and life lessons. And so when we're thinking about our society here and the United States and other places as well, um, the lots of systems are started by men um, and white supremacy. So Capricorn can be a sign that is typically difficult and patriarchal and it makes navigating that energy challenging in lots of cases. Um, this is not to say that the sign of Capricorn is not a loving and amazing sign to have in your personal chart, um, but just looking to the collective, it can be a difficult sign to navigate when big decisions or big movement needs to be made. Um, and so a fun fact that I learned while I was putting together this webinar is several prominent reproductive justice activists have Scorpio moons um, and our moon signs and our personal charts. So this is not looking at signs that we need to pay attention to for the collective, but this is the sign that the moon was in the moment you were born, the moment you came into this world, um, is the moon sign allows us to understand our own desires and passions and how we understand the world and connect with people. And so having a moon sign in Scorpio can look like having a deep commitment to transformation, a deep commitment to unearthing um, things like truths and making sure that we are in a constant and state of transformation and rebirth. Um, and I think it's really interesting that Loretta Ross and Ruth Bader Ginsburg are among those people to have Scorpio moons, especially when thinking about their impact on reproductive justice and reproductive rights. Um, and I will boast and say that I too have a Scorpio moon and have found that my work here at ReproAction energizes um, my own passions and my own work around transformation. Um, and with that, I am going to pass it back to Erin to get the panel discussion started. Thank you so much, Ten. I am delighted to introduce Jay Thibodeau, um, who uses she, her pronouns. Jay is a communicator and a queer femme who's had an abortion. Her career has been dedicated to advancing sexual health and reproductive freedom. She's worked at an independent abortion clinic in environmental and food justice and to advance queer and trans health. Um, currently, Jay is the communications director at Abortion Care Network, a national membership-based nonprofit dedicating to supporting independent abortion care providers and their allies. I want to be very clear that Jay is speaking on her own behalf today, and she's even joining us on a day off of work to do this. You're so awesome, Jay. Thank you. Um, and Jay has stellions in Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio, and loves the way that astrology affirms and connects us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jay. I am so happy to be here. There's nothing I would be uh, rather be doing on a day off. Totally geeked to be with you. So my first question <laughs> is, if you feel comfortable, would you share your sun, moon, and rising sign? And which one of these do you think contributes most to your approach to movement work? Sure. Um, so I have my, I have a Libra sun. Um, my moon is in Virgo and my rising sign is Leo. Um, so to start with sort of the easiest one, cause it points back to the rest, um, being, um, having Leo rising means that the sun rules my chart. Um, and what that means, I'm, I'm, 
Hi all, I'm still really learning about astrology, so um, bear with me as I, I work this through as we go. But um, having um, the sun as the planet or the luminary that rules my chart really to me points back to my sun sign and just sort of shines extra light and importance on my sun sign. So Libra is a sign that's about justice. It's the scales, right? We want to find balance. Um, we're sort of as obsessed with justice. Um, we love connections, relationships, um, and access have a real appreciation for pleasure. Um, so I would say that this describes a lot of my movement work and how I came to movement work. I came to this movement through um, really through um, being a queer person and working in queer and trans liberation and really approached with like a sexual pleasure um, uh, interest. Um, and then my um, my son is in my third house and the third house is a lot of things but one of the big things that 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 um sort of home to my son is is the house of communications and um as aaron said in introduction um i am a communications director and the thing that i love to do the most is work on communications talk about reproductive health rights and justice talk about queer liberation liberation, talk about messing with gender, messing with relationships, being creative, thinking about the different ways we create um, home, family, uh, relationships. Um, so those are my, and then my Virgo moon um, really resonates with me on a personal level. Um, Virgo is really sort of analytical and likes to understand things and categorize things. Um, and, and the moon, your moon sign kind of describes your emotions and your, um, how you are in your body. And I definitely am a person who um, would keep spreadsheets describing my emotions if I could, if that wasn't um, totally bonkers. Um, but I will say my, um, my moon is in the second house and I, and I don't know a ton about this, so I'm gonna read directly from Channing Nicholas's book, um, but I underlined this several times and almost fell over. So people with moon in the second house, um, your work may have something to do with fertility or infertility, conception, women, gender non-conforming folks, femmes, caregiving, nourishing others, child care, the goddess, writing or communicating. So I guess I was born for this. Okay, so we don't do this on video, but my jaw was literally dropped as you read that description. <laughs> that is incredible. Wow. And I know. Uh, just amazing. Yes, you were born for this. <laughs> the, the universe needed you right here. Um, I will just say parenthetically as an aside before going to the next thing that I think a spreadsheet for emotions is an amazing concept. And I don't think it's bonkers. I may start doing it now that you've just shared that idea. Um, I love it. Um, so next question is, what are aspects of your own personal birth chart that you think brought you to the work you do now? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that um, I'll create a spreadsheet and I'll share it because that feels like a role um, that is appropriate for what I was born for. Um, but beyond sort of that, that Libra justice oriented pleasure seeking um, placement in the third house of communication, um, my, for me, my chart is really affirming. Actually, I want to pause just for a second. And one of the things I thought about um, a lot when I was thinking about bringing a reproductive justice lens to thinking about astrology. Um, and just, you know, full disclosure, I am both our lenses and practices that are so meaningful and important and helpful to me and have informed my life and my work, but I am not an expert in either one. Um, but in thinking about applying a reproductive justice lens to astrology, one of the things I wanted to just recognize is that not everyone will have access to their own birth chart. You have to know um, to get to get an incredibly specific, accurate birth chart. You need to know your birth um, date and time and location. And because we understand people create families through adoption, um, not everyone has access to documentation and paperwork. Um, not everyone is in touch with the, their families, their you know sort of biological families of origin. So there's a lot of reasons people might not have access to their own birth chart. So I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about mine and then also bring in some of the ways that you might um, 
that some other thing, some other practices if you don't have access to your birth chart. So I just want to say that off the top. Um, and then going back to your question, Erin, about what aspects of my own personal chart brought me to the work. Um, Neptune, which is the planet of how you use your imagination and trans transcend boundaries, is in my fifth house of children, creativity activity, sex, and pleasure. Like that just feels very queer to me. Um, and it feels very, it like really affirms to me that, um, that I am primed and ready to think about family, about sex, about pleasure, um, about children in a, in a different creative way, um, in a transcendent way. Um, similarly, similarly, um, I have a, I have a lot of Scorpio in my fourth house. Um, I have four planets in Scorpio in my fourth house, which is the house of home and family, including um, Uranus, which is the planet of innovation and disruption. So again, I just feel like that rethinking of home, of family, of how we create sort of our, our unit around us and, and knowing that can look so many different ways also feels very queer to me and very affirming of the different ways we create families. Um, the my uh, seventh house of committed partnerships is ruled by Aquarius, which is kind of like a rebellious, does things differently sign. Um, and that's, you know, absolutely part of my, my personal life and also how I approach the work. Like we, we form partnerships in different ways. We have relationships in different ways. Um, let's subvert what we've been told um, is like the quote unquote right way to do it. Um, and then I just, I think other than what I've already said, I want to just say, I did a fun, like in thinking about what you might do if you don't have access to your own birth chart. Um, I did, I don't even know if this is really a thing, um, but I did sort of a, a birth chart for my first minute of my current job. So I, I plugged in the first minute that I had this job at, at Abortion Care Network to see um, sort of what would come up. And like, again, um, I got a lot of affirmation um, also, the sun was in Libra, which is really justice seeking, pleasure affirming. Um, Neptune, uh, like how you use your imagination to transcend boundaries, again, in that fifth house of like sex, creativity, pleasure, and children. Um, and then I'll just say I had like, without getting into a whole other um, house, which I could clearly go on and on, I had a lot of really interesting stuff in the 12th house, um, which um, is a lot of different things, but one of the, the um, the things that I love and appreciate about it is that it's the house of sort of the unseen or the behind the scenes behind the curtain. And that's a lot of the work that I do at Abortion Care Network. So I support other people um, to communicate publicly. I help, you know, help people write op-eds. I get them ready for interviews. And so to have that really affirming, like working behind the scenes is a place um, where I'm centered and, and where I can actually, um, not necessarily shine because that's behind the curtain, but where I, you know, where my work is, where my gifts are, um, was another really affirming thing. Ooh. Thank you for that. And just hearing you say behind the curtain as well, looking at this amazing picture of you behind the tinsel curtain is amazing. And I also just want to personally thank you as somebody who is half adopted for the inclusive way that you approach talking about a birth chart and then also being able to think about um, alternate ways people can connect, such as the first day in a job. That's really, really cool. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question I have is, are there certain signs, planets, houses, or positions that you think are particularly important to reproductive justice specifically? Hmm. I, are there certain signs? Um, I think um, I think I'm, I'm, I might be answering this one a little bit off the cuff, but one of the things that maybe has become clear in the fact that I've mentioned like almost all the planets and many of the signs and many of the houses is um, for me astrology is so much about how how infinitely many different ways there are to be. So all the different ways there are to be in your body, right? When we talk about moon signs, the ways there are to be to, to sort of experience emotions and express emotions the way there are to be in relationships to create family um, to do work and to have a public presence different ways that we connect different ways that we communicate different ways that ways that we relate to money and resources um, so you can kind of find those in all different positions in a chart and also in the current 
um, sort of astrology. If you don't know your chart, you can also pay attention to what the sky looks like now. So to me, astrology really says like, listen, there are so many different ways of being. None of them are right or wrong. They describe a snapshot of the sky when you were born, or they describe a snapshot of the sky when you started your job, or this what the sky looks like right now. And to me, that just feels very queer. It feels very affirming of the fact that there are so many ways to live in your body, to create family, to express your your gender, to have a relationship, to work. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think, I hope I'm not dodging the question, but I, I don't know that there's a particular placement, sign, planet. I think it's just um, stepping back and looking at the whole of astrology. Um, it just feels like such an affirming way to to sort of um, to say what I, you know, one of the things that I think I, I've learned a lot from reproductive justice is like, we get to decide and we get to determine what feels right for us. Um, and we should have the safety and the structures and the support and the resources to do so. Um, they're not the same thing. They're not ex analogous, but what I take from both is like, there's not a, you know, <laughs> there's so many ways to do this. And, and the question, question for us, I think, then as activists or advocates or leaders, or however you think of yourself as like, how do we make sure everyone has what they need to do that to, to live out what they were born for, um, to live out what they want and what they're seeking. Um, and I had a thought, but it slipped. So I think, does, how does that feel for an answer to that question? It's slippery. It feels, it feels great. No, I, I really appreciate it. So <laughs> Um, and if you have something else that you want to say and you're like, it came back to me, feel free to bring it back, um, including a Q&A in the end if, um, <laughs> if we're there. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, how do you see community building and astrology working together? Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, I want to first shout out Sister Song. They send out really, really beautiful full and new moon meditations and intention setting rituals. So um, I, I think they're like, when we talk about community and astrology working together, just noting like there is a really incredible organization already sort of tying these things together as are you reproaction by having this webinar. So there's some concrete things out there that you don't even, none of us have to dream up ourselves are happening. So follow Sister Song if you're not already. Um, they send those out around the new and the full moon. The beautiful thing about um, moon-based rituals is you don't have to know your birth chart at all. Um, and then other, so I actually want to read a quote um, that I pulled up from an astrologer named Alice Sparkly Cat, who uses they, them pronouns. Um, so here's a quote. I've seen the request for someone's sun, moon, or rising sign become a tender shorthand for, I'd like to know you better. And the invitation to talking about astrology be shorthand for, I'd like to hear you imagine yourself beyond how I was taught to perceive you. Through astrology, we are funny, sincere, and vulnerable. We use astrology to see each other. So I wanted to pull that up because I think when I think about um, community and astrology working together, the, the thing that has been so beautiful and healing and important to me is um, that astrology gives us a point of connection and community. Um, so it's a way for us to ask about each other, about each other. So there may be parts of your chart, or even just if you only know your sun sign, which is based loosely on the month you were born, there's ways um, we get to know each other and say, hey, does this resonate for you? Do you feel like a Libra? Do you feel like you never understood why, how this was your sign? Um, it's a way for us to connect. It's a way for us to talk to each other, about each other, and hear from each other. Um, I also think it's um, it's just like a beautiful way for us to create community. I have, a, like I'm on, I hope, I won't name any names because I don't want to, <laughs> um, I don't want to uh, intrude on anyone's privacy, but I have, I'm part of a, a Libra chat thread of people in the movement. It's, you know, it's a thing that we noticed we had in common. And now we have this like beautiful thread where we send each other jokes and encouragement and, and good news. Um, and, and then I'll just say, I think for me, it's also been really, um, when thinking about community and astrology, it's been really healing uh, to be able to 
find some community around astrology. I was raised in a pretty, um, I was raised in, in a very, very um, strict and shamey religion um, that was not an easy place to grow up as a queer person who had an abortion at 15. Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a very affirming place. Um, so, you know, I like I don't miss that church because it, it was not a healthy place to be, but I have missed sort of having community and I've missed um, for a long time. I missed having like a way to believe in magic and the unexplained um, and astrology sort of like offered that community to me again and that way to um, to connect and to believe in something bigger and more mysterious than ourselves. Wow. So I am not going to cape and pretend that I am deep in astrology. I have, I'm learning so much on this webinar. And as a result, I just want to share that based on what you've been saying and what Tanasia has already said, I'm so interested in officially going to pronounce myself astrology curious. Um, so with that in mind, um, I just want to ask, and we've got a couple minutes before our next panelist, um, how a like how much time do you devote to your astrology practice for those of us like me who may be astrology curious on the call and then how has it influenced or enriched or challenged your work um i go back and forth with how much time i will say it's been a really like in thinking also about sort of the, the like movement working community work, like it, even though what we're talking about today are other ways they connect and are related to each other, it's actually offered me a really beautiful sort of break from work. And um, I have, I have an overwork tendency and especially in this pandemic, I know it's been um, really different for different people, depending on whether they're parenting, their race, what kind of work they do. Um, for me, it's been really easy to um, stay in my house and work too much. So um, turning to an astrology podcast or a book um, or a webinar has been a really beautiful way for me to actually shift away from um, sort of the paid work that I do to, to turn my attention to something, like I said, magical and affirming and beautiful. Um, and I have a whole list and I don't, I don't want to take up, um, Nina's time at all, but, um, I'd be happy to like share a list of astrologers I recommend following if people are interested. I do want to say like black Latinx and queer and trans people are more likely in general to believe in astrology and practice astrology. So please support those people too. Um, we, um, they, A, they're under-resourced already, um, but also like let's learn from the people who are really practicing this and using this. Um, and then to really quickly in like one minute answer your last question about how it's influenced my work. Um, a lot of ways, including all the ways I talked about with my chart, but I would say the biggest thing for me is it's just been so affirming as I understand more about um, what work I love and what work energizes me and where I shine. And also, as I understand more about my chart, it, like I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. I feel like I'm working in, you know, that that justice oriented, pleasure affirming place, um, really, really be, like centered in communications. I got three placements in my third house of communications. Um, and then, you know, looking at my work chart, too, there's so much going on so much abundance, Jupiter, the planet of abundance is in the 12th house of behind the scenes work. So to me, it's been so affirming. It's uh, again, been just so nice to find community and um, something like mystical and beautiful to believe in. Um, and just like the queering of it all, like I said before, like there's not a right house or right planet or right placement. It's just like, how do we live out what we were born for um and how do we again thinking rj like how do we make sure everyone has what they need to to live the lives they want to live thank you so much jay i want to encourage folks to put any questions you have for jay in the questions tab and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end and i just want to also acknowledge a yes please on the list of astrologers that you recommend um, we actually will have a follow-up email that we're sending out tomorrow with a recording of this webinar so if you want to email those over to us we can include it in the email that goes out to everyone as well thank you so much 
Um, and I will pass it over to back to Tanisha. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you so much, Jay, for that amazing conversation. Um, so our next panelist is Shekinah Nina Davis, who uses she or unicorn pronouns. Um, so Nina Davis is an international intuitive energy healer <clears throat> and multi-modality teacher currently residing in Chicago. In addition to her intuitive energy readings, Nina is also the creator of Self Plus Loveology, a course in community designed to empower humans worldwide to heal through self agency. Thank you so much for being here, Nina. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So, the first question I have for you is What was your first introduction to astrology? Oh, my first introduction, I was in high school um, when I really started to pay attention to it. And we used to get the newspaper in class. And I always went to the horoscope section first to see if it would match what I was doing. Um, and so the column was by Georgia Nichols. And I, it just set something off in me when I realized that there were patterns in life that could be explained outside of the Bible because I grew up, grew up in a very religious household. So I thought, this is cool. I'm going to have to sneak to pursue it, but I'm definitely going to pursue it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and if you feel comfortable, would you share your sun, moon, and rising sign and which of these you think contributes most to your work? Absolutely. So my sun sign is Pisces. My moon sign is, surprise, Scorpio. So there are a lot of Scorpio moon <laughs> and Scorpio energy here. And my rising sign is Aquarius. So I'll start with my sun sign and the way that I express myself. Um, the sun sits in a very mature sign. Pisces is the most mature sign um, and placement. The, house, the 12th house is the most mature placement of the chart. And a lot of people who have had experiences with Pisces would beg to differ because Pisces can seem to be uh, unorganized, sometimes childlike. We do love to play. Um, but I think that people also miss our innate ability to tune in, tap in, and turn on to the woes of everyone else and to the injustices of everyone else. And we know how to be diplomatic in reaching out to everyone to bring them all to the table. So my sun sign in Pisces allows me to see the need, to see where healing can take place, to see where someone would like to heal, but they're not ready just yet, so I can give them resources. And then I'll circle back to them at some point. Um, it allows me to see the truth behind people's victimhood or their sense of victimhood so that I can help illuminate, because that's what the sun does. I can illuminate kind of where they put their light down, you know, or, or honey, you're hiding your light from yourself. You are standing on your self-confidence. You are giving someone else your sense of agency. And I shine that light to help bring them back to themselves. My moon in Scorpio is at 29 degrees, and that's a very mature degree, but it's also called an anoretic or a critical degree. So, um, I'm not going to use effervescent language, but I call it the leap or get off the pot degree. And that means you have to do something now. You have gone through this energy of Scorpio from one degree all the way to 29. You are going to graduate into another sign. But first, here are your finals. Did you really master the Scorpio energy, which is the deepest forgiveness, self-forgiveness first, and being able to release other people and the obligation for people to not betray you because you learned how not to betray yourself first. So I've had to learn how not to betray myself and to not be surprised when other people try to betray me or try to have a relationship with me through jealousy or envy um, or um, people who will try to have an abusive relationship with me. I have had to learn how to meet people where they are but I also had to learn how to forgive myself first so that I could meet them 
You allowed this person this much space in your life, even though they showed you in multiple ways, especially in ways that you chose to ignore, what they would do and how they would come across in your life. And so the next time your awareness has been raised, you will be able to see it coming and you can stop it. And it's not just a, I have to release people from my life. You don't serve me anymore. You're evil, you're cruel. But it's a, hey, my love, tell me what happened and let's get to the root of what happened to you so that we can continue to have a relationship or we can continue to live in the same country, in the same neighborhood, on the same street, go to the same church in the same grocery store with different opinions, but we can still make sure that we're taken care of and that we have that our needs are met and that our rights aren't trampled upon. And that can be really tough for people to walk around with that much forgiveness. Um, and then my Aquarius rising allows me to be that weird, unique unicorn that is able to see things from a different perspective, which then allows me to illuminate other people on how they can shift their perspective. That maybe they were thinking about an issue one way when there were actually four components to it and how we can acknowledge all of them and how they work together, which is very Aquarian, so that um, the world, because that's Aquarius energy as well, is a much better place for us, a much safer place for us to explore our lives, our sensuality, and our sexuality. I hope that answered your question. It absolutely does. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for the deep dive into the sign of Scorpio in the moon. I, as a Scorpio moon, really resonate with that and appreciate uh, the transparency around big, deep emotions. Um, the next question I have for you um, is related to the previous of what are the aspects of your personal chart that brought you to the work you're doing as a intuitive energy healer and having courses and community to empower um, humans? Well, I have, um, uh, well, let me say this. I believe that every sign in the zodiac, the entire zodiac and astrology in and of itself has everything to do with reproductive justice. It's just learning how to read the language of the signs. And when I began to learn to read the language of my natal chart, to really speak my own language is what it is. And we do it all the time. Um, I listened to Tim speak and immediately I could tell where some of the placements were, especially Scorpio. And we, we tend to speak our charts, we're all of it. We move the way our chart is set up, you know? And so um, there isn't necessarily one particular placement, but one of my favorite placements that I think definitely helps me in um, the vessel that I am for reproductive justice is the sign of Libra. And so we know that then this is a very truncated um, description of Libra and Pluto that I'm gonna give you, but it's, it's the gist of it. And so Libra is the sign of relationships, okay? And law, it deals with contracts, marriage, because marriage is a contract, justice, equality, and harmony. And it's one of the major signs that rules reproductive justice, in my opinion, because it's also ruled by the planet Venus, which is the planet that seeks to explore love and culture, social diplomacy, and even the way we use our money and value system through other people. And the planet Pluto, which represents deep transformations through cycles of death and rebirth, sits in the sign of Libra in my chart. Um, and Pluto moves at a snail's pace in the cosmos, so it's influential in a sign. It just spans generations. So if you hear someone say, I have Pluto in Virgo, that spans um, about a decade or so, a little bit more than a decade. If you say, I have Pluto in Libra, you know that this person was born between 1971 and 1984. And so I was born through the generation that was called the Roe versus Wade generation or the consciously uncoupling generation as we're known now. Um, and so the previous generation that was before us had Pluto in Virgo. They started to change legislature and things like that. 
Um, and then we had Pluto and Leo going back even further. And Pluto and Leo includes the iconoclastic Bell Hooks, who was born in 1952, and the esteemed Loretta Ross, who was mentioned earlier. Uh, she was born in 1953. And so they were born in the same generation where Pluto was residing, deep transformation. Um, and so it's no coincidence that both of them have been able to take the works of previous generations to set the stage and to change things. Um, they have added so much to the lexicon and were greatly appreciative and grateful for the work that they've done, um, them along with their counterparts, because of course it just wasn't them, but along with their counterparts and, and the previous generations, we've greatly benefited from them. So this placement in my chart of Libra and Pluto, Pluto and Libra, lets me know that I am here to help bring more balance back into the world. I'm here to hang out with the people who have Pluto in Libra and the people who have Pluto in Virgo, the people before us, and people who have Pluto in Scorpio, the generation after us. And we are going to build bridges together for total transformation in regards to human rights because any type of thing that we're fighting for in regards to feminism or even reproductive justice, that has to include human rights. And so we're making sure that um, with Pluto and Libra, for me at least, that I'm stacking upon and I'm scaffolding on what the previous generations have, have set up so that the generations after me have something more innovative and something more um, interpersonal and interrelational to build upon. And their work has allowed me to stand in my own reproductive autonomy. And it allows me to teach the art of self-actualization to others because I have a voice in my generation that their generations didn't have. Thank you so much. That was a really beautiful explanation of your personal chart affecting your work and explaining the generational impact of Pluto. I always find myself getting kind of confused at how to interact with that placement in my chart. Um, and I love to hear other people's approach to it. And my last question for you here is, kind of, is re again, related to the previous one, but just expanding upon this idea of justice and astrology interlapping um maybe less so in personal charts but more so in a collective manner are there ways you see those connections i know we recently just had the great conjunction which is welcoming us soon into an age of aquarius away from capricorn and i'm wondering how you view astrology's impact on our work in the justice fields Oh, wonderful. I love this question. Um, I believe, and now I could be wrong, but I know that Tim mentioned Capricorn um, and how Capricorn can represent um, basically old traditions and the patriarchy, the part of the patriarchy that just does not serve us at all. Um, and I want to kind of backtrack because we had a lot of energy in Capricorn um, over the last two years or so. We've had eclipses, and the south node and north node were there. We had a, just a bunch of activity that was literally saying, hey, I need you to begin to destroy the foundation that our current society was built on because we're beyond that now. We've evolved past that, but it's kind of like wearing clothes that are too small. You know, you kind of have to unbuckle your pants every time you eat. Oh my goodness, they've split. Let me put a patch on them and all of a sudden you're walking around like the Hulk with tattered pants. Instead of saying, you know what? It's time to innovate and do something different. I have grown, I have evolved. So that brings us into the sign of Aquarius. And you mentioned the, the stellium um, that we just had, which was absolutely just so powerful and fantastic. I think a lot of people aren't going to feel the effects of that until Leo season really. And then in Aquarius season, um, next year as well. But this is kind of just the beginning of bridging the gap from the age of um, Pisces into the age of Aquarius, where 
we have, you know, the whole bleeding heart and we are the world. And now it's, yes, we are the world. And because we are the world, we have to make sure that not only do people um, have a right to um, be intimate with whomever they want to, they now actually have the right to stand in their true authenticity. And if they were born with particular body parts that were once labeled something to someone else, they are allowed to say who they are without society pressuring them to conform to something in particular that, well, it's just traditional. Um, and so I'll give you um, a really quick rundown um, of Loretta, uh, Loretta Ross's chart really quickly. Um, she said that one of her professors said something that changed her life. I think his name was Reverend C.T. Vivian. And he told her, he asked her, um, he said, when you ask people to give up hate, then you need to be there for them when they do. And I think that is really, really important because she's from the Pluto and Leo generation who literally had this innate roar. She has a bunch of planets, a stellium of planets, which we call a crown of stars um, in her chart that takes leadership to the forefront. She also has, she also has a Scorpio moon. And when she was born, she was born with Chiron in her eighth house, which is also Scorpio, the house of sex, violence, reproductive organs, secrets, other people's money and abuse. And I'll show you how this played out. Her placements speak of the sexual violence that she experienced. Um, she almost died from an infection caused by a faulty birth control device. She experienced um, rape and mistreatment and those experiences were what created the initial spark for her life's work. Um, her interest into motherhood, which is that moon in Scorpio, was marked by the moon um, and this makes her dedicated to eradicating the hidden laws and clauses that cause mothers and those who do not wish to be mothers to remain disempowered. She is here about empowerment and she unveils the secrets that literally kill people who are trying to birth or people who have decided they do not want to birth. And she's doing it in plain sight. And she even used that scorpionic energy regarding other people's money to challenge the system by suing it in order to bring all levels of justice, including financial justice to women. And so she's actually gonna play an even bigger part in what's happening in the next few years because she has in her crown of stars, meaning in the sign of Leo, um, she has the sun, her expression, Mercury, the way she speaks, Mars, the way she takes action and actualizes in the world, her south node, these are gifts and tools from previous lifetimes or from her childhood and experiences that she's learned, and Pluto, the planet of total transformation, they are all in the sign of Leo for her. And she has this fierce courage to stand alone in the crowd while directing the crowd to stand in their own autonomy. And she has Saturn and Neptune in the sign of Libra in her chart, reproductive justice again, right? Um, and so she's going to be an example because we're moving into Aquarian energy. Aquarius is the opposite sign of Leo. They work together, even though they're the opposites of one another, they really reflect one another. So she has been showing us how to stand up for ourselves because when you are able to stand up for yourself, you are then able to stand up for the collective. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it absolutely does. And I am so thankful for all of the knowledge you are sharing here. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Erin before we get into our Q&A. Thank you so much, Nina. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, Tanasia. And thank you, Jay. Um, so if you have questions for our panelists, uh, feel please feel free to put them in the questions tab. I'll get to as many as we can. Um, so a quick content note. So please plug into repro action campaigns. We wanna, we wanna connect. So sign up for alerts at www.reproaction.org to get our emails. Um, if you do that, you will never miss an invitation to these monthly act and learn webinars that we do. Um, we have a different topic every month. They're free, free and open to the public, and we want you to never miss an invite. So please do sign up to get on our list if you're not already. 
And then please follow us on social media. We are ReproAction on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And save the date for our next Act and Learn webinar, which will be on Thursday, April 8th, and that it'll be from 1 to 2 Eastern time. And the topic will be faith-driven activism. I'm very excited about that webinar as well. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Q&A. And um, I'm going to start with this question. Um, so have you read the charts of any movement organizations or coalitions that feel powerful and reflective of their work, whether that's ACN, ReproAction, or other organizations? And um, Kelsey does volunteer that All Above All is a Leo. Any of our panelists, including 10, if you want to take that on, any chart reading for movement organizations? I um, I recently looked up a chart in regards to Roe versus Wade, um, and it, I, it's not, you know, of course, an organization, but it's definitely something that has impacted reproductive justice, and um, it has a huge Capricorn stellium that's in the 11th house. So this tells me that on the opposite side was ca uh, cancer in the fifth house. So women were standing up for themselves. Queer people were standing up for themselves and literally telling the system, and we're tearing you down. We're done with it. Absolutely no more. And it's really interesting to see the rest of the placement and how they have continued to play out um, and how because we're coming up, I think we just experienced the 30th year in 2002 for Roe versus Wade. We'll be experiencing another 29, 30-ish year cycle, which is a Saturn cycle. Um, which is a cycle of, hey, have you been carrying out your responsibilities? You set out on a journey, you set out goals and plans and tenets, you wanted to create a new foundation. Have you done that? Have you been responsible with the work? And so that's gonna happen, I believe, in like 2032, 33-ish. So the work that we're doing right now, we are going to have to answer to if we've been doing this work genuinely, authentically, and not out of sheer anger or frustration, but in order to make sure that we're not dismissing anyone who immediately is not concerned about reproductive justice, but that we're calling them in. We're pulling them on our team one way or another, even if they just donate, they may not change their minds, but they may donate, they may try. And so the Aquarian age is literally saying, we've moved away from the Capricorn energy of shutting people out now we have to allow people in so that the change can be impactful and lasting. So we're coming up on that um, 20, 33-ish. So hopefully everyone, I think everyone here is doing the work and we have to make sure that we extend ourselves to other people, especially our youth. Thank you for that, Nina. Jay or Ten, anything additional you wanna add? Um, just learning so much from Nina, and I have nothing <laughs> to add to that other than appreciation. And of course, all above all is a Leo. That makes sense to me. I'm curious to know what repro action sign is. I I'm I don't know the exact day that um, we started doing this work, but I would love to know if you know off the top of your head, Erin. So I can give you July 2015, and if you need an exact date, I can definitely get that to you. Well, it sounds like maybe a Cancer or a Leo, which is all great energy. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, okay, so next question um, I'm gonna ask is what is, um, also I just, Nina, I got the chills when you were referring to in a few years, like 2022, 2023 is going to be a big turning point um, vis -vis the Roe v. Wade decision because we see those same things happening with um, at, at a different level of the Supreme Court, um, cases that may be going up and different composition of the court. Um, so the, I think that's a good segue to the next question. What does astrology say about where our movement is heading? Are there any events that will be big turning points? Um, and I'll open that up to our panelists and whoever would like to jump in. Well, 
Okay, I'll hop in. <laughs> um, so this year we are going to have um, some Saturn square Uranus aspects. And basically what that means is Saturn, the big papa of the zodiac, the planet that says um, self-discipline is necessary, but self-discipline extends from self-love. We are not going to be hard on ourselves. We are going to actually work on ourselves. So um, Saturn says, I am going to square. I'm going to bring some frustration, some friction between the old and the new, which is Uranus. That's what Uranus represents. It's the sudden change, um, a new perspective shift, that aha moment, that epiphany that changes everything. Saturn can be restrictive at times. Um, and it'll say, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Uranus comes along, along and says, now, absolutely now. Don't plan, don't pack, we don't have time for it right now. Um, Uranus is that sudden flash of genius and innovation. And so Saturn squaring that, Saturn comes to kind of agitate us and frustrate us into movement. Saturn says, I want you to be frustrated enough to move because we've been too gentle. I gave you Mercury retrograde to go back and think about some things. I even gave you a retrograde in Neptune so that you can disillusion yourself and you're still not moving. So here's a little frustration for you. Um, and we had one in February, so that's already passed. But if you go back to around February 17th, maybe a week before and a week after, you may find, especially if you look at your camera rolls, that's kind of like my photo journal. <laughs> you can kind of tell what energy was happening around that time, which we had a bunch of energy in Aquarius. We are going to have another one June 14th. And when that happens, oh my goodness, um, we're going to have a lot of places restricting due to COVID. And we're going to have a lot of places that are going to go free willy nilly as if COVID didn't exist. And there are going to be clashes with the old administration. Unfortunately, well, I don't want to say unfortunately, but there are issues in regards to our government and the transfer of power that are going to come back up. And we are going to have a lot of our elders and seniors who are going to assist in this movement of acknowledging that people have body autonomy and sexual autonomy. But we're gonna have who my grandfather would call olders. He would say you can grow into an elder and be wise and help the future generations, or you can be an older and dismiss them and become selfish. So we're gonna have our elders helping and the olders trying to oppose the changes that are necessary for us to move into a better future. And that better future literally is the future that we want to create. And then the final date will be December 24th. So right before Christmas, um, we are going to be getting this kind of like clash of power and almost the, the, final, um, the final battle between the old and the new, what needs to happen. Um, I don't know if anyone is watching American Gods, but there are the old gods and there are the new gods. And it's, are you going to adapt? Will the new gods trump the old gods or vice versa? So it's kind of that energy, it's big energy. Countries are still fighting for vaccines and uh, resources, but the age of Aquarius is going to make sure that we have those. But first, we're going to have some friction. It's going to feel crazy. First you can travel, then you can't travel but we've already had a preview of how to be with ourselves while still being able to, develop, um, to help the collective and to assist the collective with the gifts that we have. We've had a lot of time at home to kind of learn about ourselves. And so we're gonna be called to the forefront to stand at the brink of change and then create it. So uh, buckle up everyone because reproductive justice is moving into the future. The language is going to change. We are pushing for new language and new legislature that recognize people outside of um, male and female. And of course, this has been happening for a while. But again, the previous generations, especially Pluto and Leo, they showed us how to start from that fiery place because Leo is ruled by the sun, it's fire. But it's also fixed. Some of them have gotten to a point where they're still not willing to acknowledge zers and mixes. They'll only go as far as LGBTQ, not anything after that. So now we're bridging that gap and we're making sure that everyone is included. But we're using the Aquarius side now that says we can't stay in the old mindset. It is time to change. So 
I hope that if you experience February 20th as something great, fantastic, that will continue to happen. If it kind of jarred you, that means that you need to see where the frustration is so that you can feel the frustration. Use communication to damper and then blast out any miscommunications and any frustrations in regards to why you're not being listened to or heard on the reproduct reproductive justice front. Seek to innovate your language and innovate your approach. And I promise you, because this is Saturn and Uranus, the rewards will be bigger and better than you could have ever imagined if you take the effort to do something new. I'm done. Thank you, Nina. That is such a great note to end our webinar on. And I also want to thank um, Jay for your incredible contributions as well. And especially huge thanks to Taneja Henson, Repro Action Campaign Coordinator, who envisioned this webinar, dreamed it up, and then actually brought it to fruition. This has been absolutely spectacular. We look forward to joining you next month. Thank you. Thanks all.